Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring music, education, technology, and the intersections between them with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. Thanks to my sponsor this week, Scale Exercise Play Along Tracks. With me today is Dr. Corey Niels, here to talk about developing your second brain with personal knowledge management apps. I'm always like excited to find people like you who are out there. It's like, I don't know how many of us there are. Like, I don't know how many Obsidian, you know, Notion using music educators. I kind of hope there, there are more every day, but yeah, it seems like a small group, or at least it's the thing, if everyone does it, no one talks about it. So it's hard to say where, where the actual numbers lie, but I'm really excited to, to talk with you about this because this is honestly something that I've been passionate about before the technology existed and saw it as a need and just didn't have the expertise for the time to invest in. And now it's just the tools are out there and there are other people, even above you and I, that are talking about this at a really high level that we're able to kind of steal things from and adapt them to our needs, which is a great ecosystem to be in, I think. Yeah, well, I actually kind of want to start, I think like um, perhaps an introduction to this topic might be best served by me talking about why I have resisted talking about it until now and why I think this is maybe a good time for sure. it to be yeah. on the show. But even before that, do you want to introduce yourself to the listeners of the show? Who, like who you are? What you do? Sure, like a, like a little potted background sort of thing or... As, um, as short or long as you like. We'll try and keep it short because I'm known for talking too much. I have a tattoo in my arm that tells me one day I will find the right words and they will be simple uh, for a reason. That is a warning to me more than anything. Um, so about me. So I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, kind of like where the roads aren't is where I grew up, uh, about two hours north of Pittsburgh and did my undergraduate at uh, Vanderkoek College of Music in Chicago. Um, Throughout all of that, through high school and in, into college, I was a member of the Cavaliers Drum and Bugle Corps. And so that kind of framed the beginning of my musical background, so to speak. Um, after Vandercook, I, I had the opportunity to come down here to Texas and teach in Keller ISD, which is up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Taught there for two years, moved down to Houston, taught for two years at Klein Forest High School, and then I was the head director at Waller High School for four years after that. Did my master's at the University of Houston, where I now work. Uh, and then after that, went up to Seattle, a completely different place, and did my doctorate at the University of Washington, had a position at Kennesaw State University on the other side of the continent, outside of Atlanta, uh, for two years. And then we ended up moving back here about five years ago, um, and I got the, the music education job at U of H and have been here ever since and, and really enjoyed it. And throughout all of that, I work with drum corps, I've designed drill, I've written for marching bands, I've kind of done kind of a lot of the things you would expect in the band space for a French horn player to be able to do. So everything but jazz band really, because I swing from a rope and that's about it. So that's kind of the, the framing of where I come from um, on top of having you know ADD, which makes the need for organizational tools and the need for a thought process to keep myself on the rails, so to speak, a more valuable thing than maybe it might be for others. Yeah, that was actually a great segue into the whole PKM thing. So, I mean, today's episode is all about knowledge management are in the, like, as far as uh, the tools, the apps that are used, you know, it's called personal knowledge management or PKM. And I found out about you through, uh, I was not at the Texas Music Educators Association Conference this past year, but Teresa Hoover, friend of the show, um, saw your session and guide, the guidebook app, you know, the, the kind of like planning, scheduling thing that uh, attendees use. And your session was called, uh, I believe it was called building, uh, I'm sorry, your second music teacher brain. Mm -hmm. Or something yeah. to that effect. Yeah, building and a second music teacher brain. So it, was, it was definitely riffing off the Tiago Forte sort of second brain paradigm. Yeah, and, and that just like sent off all the, the triggers in my mind, because if I were there, you would be exactly the kind of person who I would hunt down and try to find like, who, who else is doing this. You know, I've, I've resisted. I want to talk about like, what is this category of apps? What is this topic? But I, I think I should say that I have sort of like flirted with this topic in recent episodes. Um, there's an episode on research that I did a year or two ago, and then more recently, uh, one on the app craft, which is a PKM app. So if someone is, uh, has listened to those or wants to go back and listen to those, those might provide kind of like what some of my workflows are. I mean, I'm not in higher education, um, but I find that like in being a practicing music teacher, uh, of any kind really, but especially it, it just in my life, it's, it's really hard to continue learning things. And so using tools that help me to grab little bits of professional learning here and there and sort of like organize where I read them and like my notes 
on them and try to have that be a central, or at least have there try to be a connection between the different apps I use to read and reference and, and note take and things has, has been a big part of my journey. Um, I'm always trying to use the right tool for the job, but also always trying to like condense the amount of apps I'm using. Um, so I, you know, I started using Craft and Obsidian both around this time last year. So I'm about a year in. I feel like I have a pretty good lay of the land for both. I know what their strengths and weaknesses are. I think that I've been hesitant to cover this topic precisely because of this bit here. It's like, well, what what is this category? Why does somebody need to use these? And I will admit that while I think that there are certain topics that resonate with a wider range of the audience members of this podcast, I get the most personalized messages about some of these like more like power user kinds of topics like things mm. like uh, i did one on relational databases a few years ago that i still get email about um i get you know the, the craft episode generated a lot of um listener responses so people who at least are the vocal maybe small group of people who like this kind of stuff have told me they want more about research apps they want more about man productivity they want more management so i i'm hoping that um, that is enough for my listeners. And, and then I'm also hoping that you can introduce this topic as someone who has presented on it before. Yeah. Like, what is PKM and why does it need to exist? So PKM to me, and I, I think PKM is kind of a framework more than it is like a, a set of rules that are handed down from the top of the mountain to us. Um, and it's, it's a way to think about the volume of information we come across and what we have to deal with every day as teachers and also as people. Um, and so within that idea, to me, this, what you just pointed out, Robbie is, is that we are constantly trying to like grab little snippets of things and fuse them in and use them in, in creative and intelligent ways to help ourselves and help our students. And the critical piece there is less energy expended equals more ability to retain. Like if we spend all this time and energy getting this information and we have to keep up with everything else things start to fall off. We have a limited amount of focus that we can give during a day. And we've, we definitely have a limited amount of time. Like any teacher who's had the, the 20 minute lunch and that's the only break you get in the day understands there just isn't time to do a lot of things. So the ability to kind of create this, this second brain, I think that's a, a great way to put it that people much smarter than me have kind of phrased it as um, is a, a way to think about this idea of managing your personal knowledge and your in your growth in a way that fits within what you do and don't have time for and energy for during the day. And so the why now aspect of it is it's not we're not going backwards. We are in a almost I would say fully in many ways digital ecosystem when it comes to our jobs and it comes to our our work as music teachers. I mean even to the point that some places don't have you know, music that is paper copies anymore. Everything's on an iPad. Everything's a PDF, which I think is great as someone whose locker looked a bit like uh, a tornado went through it when I was in high school. Digital organization is just an easier thing to wrap your head around. And that is not going to change. It's not going to go back to paper and pencil. It's not going to go back to quill and, and scribes. It's, it's only going to become more digitally encased and having tools to grapple with the volume of information that allows for is, I think, critical to us as teachers and us as, as learners, too, because we're constantly trying to update what we know. And the only way you do that is by creating space to have access to the information in a time and a place that you can synthesize it versus just, oh, I'm going to do that thing and you forget about it. I mean, I, I don't know about you or any of your listeners, but I know I have notebooks full of notes that I have no idea what's in them. Like I just, I wrote them down. I thought it was really intelligent at the time, especially going to places like Midwest or TMEA or, or any of the conferences that we go to. And then all of a sudden it gets shoved back in your bag and you forget about it. What PKM allows for is because it's digital, it allows you to either set a reminder to look at it later or just go back to it and put it where it needs to go to help you embed it in your process or discard it if it really wasn't that intelligent. I mean, probably 80% of what we write down really isn't worth the paper we wrote it on, but the 20% that is needs to be retained. And I think this offers a really good system to do that as a way of thinking about stuff at irrespective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, and we're gonna, there's some connotations that come with apps that market themselves as PKM tools that um, that are like, like I think if you look at one on the surface and you'd have no idea what this category of software is, you're going to either either be immediately confused or wonder like what exactly it's trying to solve. Like, is it note taking? Is it tasks? Is it events? Like what 
kind of things it's trying to solve. And I think that there are some uh, features that are consistent across most of the apps, at least in our outline here. Um, do, I mean, what do you, how would you describe this, what this software actually does or what problem it solves? Uh, and then what are some of the defining features of PKM software? Um, so I think the problem it tries to solve is just dealing with a massive amount of information that you have to keep track of and allowing you to iteratively go back to it or put it aside for a time and, and bring it back up. But within that, like you pointed out, there are a lot of different solutions. There's task managers, there's note taking, there is things that basically look like a relational database that allow you to connect information and, and basically learn more by, by those connections and see trends and patterns. Um, and so some of the defining features of kind of PKM software across the board or PKM paradigms across the board, because you can't get into uh, pen and paper versions of this, um, are the ability to write down small pieces of information and organize them through some sort of encasing structure. So like on many apps, you have the tagging idea where it's either like a hashtag where it's actually a tag that you identify. It's okay, this is talking about site reading. This is talking about tone production. This is talking about fingering systems. You can just add that into that little chunk of information. And all of a sudden, through the power of databases, it links it all together. So that's one of the defining features. The other I found is that to some degree or another, there will always be something that looks more like, hey, do you want to share this? Do you want to give this to other people? Do you want to collaborate with them? And many apps do that to varying degrees of success. I think Craft does a fantastic job of, of doing that through its ability to share as basically a website like that, I think is, is a fantastic sort of uh, use of that tool. But then you have, you know, Notion allows you to export things as PDFs, um, Obsidian, Rome, Athens, all those tend to be a little bit more text heavy, but they do allow you to export as different file formats to convert to other things. So I, I think the, the idea of like capturing your information, organizing your information, distilling it into what you need to use it for, and then exporting it somehow are kind of the, the four main phases in there. And anything else like a task manager or a to-do list or you know various other things are just bells and whistles that are added to that that you might or might not find use for depending on what you your preferences are and what your context is. Yeah, I would describe my use and I'll I'll say craft and obsidian we can and we'll get into this after we've covered some of the options, but um they're both somewhat note like in that I'm taking down text information sometimes um, some like web links or some images, but yes, a lot of my notes are very, very small and short. And then the thing for me that is the feature that is consistent, at least all the ones I've used is like this backlinking thing where you mm. put mm -hmm. double brackets mm -hmm. on uh, either side of a, a word or a string of text, and then it will create a link to that, to a note by its same name within your same database. So like this idea of almost creating like a little internal, like wiki for your information where keywords um, that you've highlighted will link exactly to notes by those same names or tags by that same name in another note somewhere else in the database. Right, and Obsidian's a great one for that. And that's kind of native in that. Rome is similar. I don't know if you played with Rome at all, um, but it's it's kind of like the web-based and somewhat uglier version of, of Obsidian. Um, the thing I really like though about some of the other solutions are it's not just text. A lot of them, Craft being one, but also uh, Notion, where you can embed all sorts of rich media in there, be it videos, YouTube links. I use that a lot in planning for my classes where I want to, okay, we're going to listen to this recording today and you're going to respond to it like you're a band director. I have that link already in there. I can just click on it during class or send the link to the students. And it just, it makes, again, it makes that a lot easier because it creates those that place to put the stuff. And the idea of the bi-directional linking that you pointed out, I think is critical to some aspects of the, the PKM ecosystem, but not all. Like I, the bi-directional linking, I think is fantastic if you use it judicious, judiciously. It's, it's kind of like when you highlight a book when you're reading it. If you highlight every word, you suddenly don't have highlights, you just have a yellow book. So it's being selective and very targeted in what those keywords are so that you can create a stronger network of connections within your small notes and not be overwhelmed by the number of different ways to slice the data that you have because not everything is gonna be useful to you. And the process of learning where to draw that line is a process. It's not something we can give you ahead of time, unfortunately. Yeah, a lot of these tools do require a lot of self-reflection about how you want to use the tool which is, you know, some, some, some of the easier, maybe more like user friendlier options. Like, I mean, so, someone might ask like, why not just use the notes app on my iPhone or something? And, you know, to, 
for some people that might work really well. Yeah. Um, I think the, the, some of the the like power features of this uh, the PKM apps kind of do force you to build your own build your own functionality into them. And I don't mean to s immediately scare off any listeners, but like there, there's a little bit of self reflection in the process of just simply using the tool, like thinking about right. how do I actually want to use this? What's working for me? And I think that that self reflection while it doesn't uh it might seem like it's spent making you spend more time learning the tool than actually using the tool i feel like that's um is a helpful reflection to like i'll, I'll use for example omnifocus as my task manager and omnifocus some people argue you need a, a phd in it to use it successfully and i i find that um that was like uh, I, I fought it at first but now that i've like sort of worked with it strengths and limitations i have have a better idea like what i personally can handle because at the end of the day like it doesn't matter what tool you use, like if you can't do, there's only so much time in a day, you can't do unlimited things with your time. And I feel like understanding your app means you understand your process, which means you kind of understand your limitations as a human being, which is kind of ultimately what we're trying to solve anyway. Right. And the, the fact that our limitations as a human being are coming into direct conflict with the quantity of information we're expected to kind of grapple with on a daily basis. You know, especially us being music teachers, often we're responsible for hundreds of students by ourselves. And we have parent communication and curriculum and lesson plans and all the things, not to mention grading and literature and rehearsal. And you know, like the part of the job we, we got into it for. Um, and so the, the ability of these apps to help bring that down to human scale. I think is a really valuable thing. And, and like you said, knowing the limitations of your app, but also knowing what you need out of the app is a critical piece that it's it's not a fast process, but I don't think it's meant to be a fast process. You know, I spent a lot of my life being very uh, impatient for things to get to X, whatever X was at, at that point, given the, the thing that I was doing. And in my, you know, in my old age now in my forties, I realized it's like, it's gonna take the time it takes for you to find your feet in these. And there's some ways you can set yourself up and have a good strategy for it. But at the end of the day, it takes the time it takes because that is how you as an individual learn. So for instance, you know, you might just wrap your arms around OmniFocus and really get into it, but some people might just be repelled by it and there might be better solutions for them that are maybe simpler or different or serve a different need. And so that's the great thing about right now, gets back into the, the why now question, is we have access to so many more tools now. There are so many right. people out there developing these things because one, they think it's cool in some cases, and two, they want to make money, sometimes both, that we have access to this just bouquet of solutions that can become bespoke in the way we combine them in our lives. And some people are just the one, the notes app on your phone, that's all you need. That's fantastic, but that doesn't serve every person's need. So having these options and having a way to think through how to select those options is a good strategy to have to basically make your journey in this area a stronger one, but also a more productive and a more enjoyable one. Yeah, there's a, so many of these apps too, because there's so many different brains and perspectives mm -hmm. in the world. And like somebody will be using one of these tools and think like, ah, well, actually it makes more sense to me if it worked this way. And then something can come of that, you know, a new piece of software can develop. And, and I think that there's, uh, we're only just seeing in the beginning, you know, as people, um, continue. And some of the ones on this list are actually highly customizable. And I think that's something to consider as we sort of go through the basics mm -hmm. of each one uh, for someone listening is like, do you, does one of these, you know, it, one of them that's maybe more simple might have a wider range of appeal to more people. Whereas a more complicated one, one might similarly have a wide range of appeal because, well, it might not work the way you want it to out of the box, but you can kind of tweak it. Right. To do your bidding. And that's kind of how I feel about Obsidian, not to be a spoiler here, but um, that's, <laughs> I don't know. What do you think? Can we, can we like do a bit about like maybe some, I added some stuff actually, just as we, you were talking here that you made me think of, we got about eight, nine or 10 different tools on this list. Is it possible maybe that we kind of do an elevator pitch for each one and talk yeah. about Cool. Yeah, I know totally. less about Notion than perhaps anything else on this list and it's first. So, okay. Um, I, I can take that one because I, I use it pretty extensively, like I said, in, in planning for my courses. Um, Notion, the way I would describe Notion is um, if you're familiar with Evernote, as a an app it's like evernote's big brother who does fancier things um at least that's the way i learned about it at first i've since gotten back to evernote and seen that they've made some improvements since i used them back in the early 2010s but um, notion is a a great place for creating projects that can link together 
where it struggles a little bit is bidirectional linking. It exists, but it's not as fluid or intuitive uh, an interface as something like an Obsidian or a, a Rome or, or kind of the more natively built versions of the craft, for, for example, as well. Um, the great thing about Notion, though, is that it has the ability to customize your space to the way you want. You can create templates, you can create um, tables, you can create databases. All these different things can live natively inside Notion and they look good. The, the, the UX and UI is, is a pretty pleasing experience, but also they're powerful in that you can use them to gain insight into things. For instance, at the beginning of every semester, I create a table in one of my Notion pages for the class that I'm teaching that has all my students their primary instrument, because I'm teaching a, a band director methods class. So it's good to know what they play as a primary instrument, where they went to high school, which kind of tells me a little bit about their background and, and what they might've experienced. Um, and then, you know, the normal stuff like email and phone number, if I need to get a hold of them, but using that, I can start sorting, okay, all these kids in, in our case here in Texas, all these kids are from a similar area. All of these kids are from like the Northwest suburbs of Houston. And these kids are from the North you know, east suburbs of Dallas. And like, I can kind of get pockets of things and be able to see those patterns in Notion really strongly and really clearly without a lot of effort on my part. Um, now, it does way more than that. It's it's a really powerful tool for organizing. And actually, it has a really, I've not used this very much, but I know it has a really strong collaborative team-based paradigm to it as well, where you can have multiple people going in and using these templates to check processes, to do large tasks. There's a, a Kanban board sort of built into it as well, which kind of lives in a lot of other places in other apps that we'll talk about. But, and we can talk about what a Kanban board is if you want to, but it allows for that sort of collaborative interaction with this rich data ecosystem that is also just pleasing to look at. And I, I Personally, I love like the green screen text, like TRS-80 old school because I'm old, but not everybody does. Some people really need that, uh, the point and click, the kind of mouse keyboard environment to feel like what they're doing is looks good or is, is what they want it to be. Totally fine. Notion ticks that box as well. Yeah, some of the tools on this list are more um, or less web friendly and things that sort of feel native to the web versus like being an app that you install on your computer and that sort of just like, you know, only is you have, where you have your own sort of like personal data that you and only you look at, um, they have different strengths and weaknesses. Like Notion, I feel like is maybe not, um, it's maybe like in some respects a little more clunky than some of the other apps on this list, but it has uh, that collaborative option, which seems to be mm -hmm. more of a feature of like the web-based PKM apps. Uh, it also has like, APIs, basically like hooks that other apps and developers or even you, the user, can mm -hmm. use to basically like, like for example, we'll get to later, I have an app I use called Drafts, which is just a quick capture for text on mm -hmm. my iPhone. And you can program an action in the drafts that it'll send a little text note that you took really quickly. Like say, you know, you get an idea while you're on the podium, you just type it down into your phone real quick. Well, later you can send that straight into your Notion database using their web tools. It's, it's sort of an always online and always connected kind of approach to this. Right, which I think kind of gets to the, the one of the critical features that lives underneath the hood, underneath the use of a PKM app, is that it's always available. It never goes away. It's persistent in space and time and, and your ability to access it. Now, the only way that gets you know, on the bad side is when the electricity goes off, which we experienced in Texas a couple of Februarys ago, um, and they're telling us might happen again. So if we lose connection here. That's what happened. ERCOT turned off the, uh, the power because we're, you know, we're in that place right now because it's 100 degrees outside. But um, the, the biggest thing I think that you just pointed out that I think is really important for people to remember is that these things are persistent. They do not go away. You have access to them all the time and you can send things to them in a time frame that you might not actually need to do it yourself. So the idea of APIs and webhooks and the kind of automations we can build in are really powerful. Um, though they're a little scary to think about if you're not familiar with that side of technology, they're still an incredibly powerful thing. Even if you only use one or two a day, it's gonna make your life better. Maybe I'm being scary by mentioning some of that powerful stuff now, but I will say that Notion, uh, all you need to do if you're listening is go to their website which will be linked in, in the show notes to this episode. I, I think that Notion also has a very graphically appeal, appealing, it has a very um, appealing user interface for a lot yes. of people. Like just the way that um, it is able to handle, I would say, argue like m like more varieties of data, like tables, tasks, projects, the more, and the way that it sort of has unique 
user interface cues that sort of indicate like all of those different things. Um, I think mm -hmm. that that really appeals to a lot of people. And the fact that it lives on the web is a feature, not a bug for some people who are using most of their software on the web. Like if you're living inside of a Canvas or a Google Classroom, like a learning management software and you use Gmail and a tab and you're just, everything you're using is like a tab that's open in your web browser, Notion might be just another tab mm -hmm. that you got open. So or it might replace a lot of tabs for you if you are using it at, on the app on your, your computer. I know I personally will have my iPad up on my um, my like lectern in the classroom and just have my notes for the day there that I'd written down on my PC earlier or my, my Mac earlier in the day and just it syncs over. It's it's cross-platform. It's really, really nice. And, and like you said, the, the user interface and user experience, the UI UX aspect of it, I think is probably one of the best in the game, Craft being the other major player that we'll get to later, I know. Yeah. Um, I, so actually, I was going to say, I feel pretty comfortable starting off Readwise, Craft, and Obsidian, but not these other ones. Can we just bounce back and forth for a few minutes here? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, great. So here's here's my sales pitch for Readwise. And Readwise is something that you can use it, it, whether you use any of the PKM apps that we mentioned or not, because Readwise is a tool that it is a web service that, well, it's also an app. And what it does is it allows you to link up a bunch of uh, inputs that are, are sort of like services that you might use to read content. So like you can link a Kindle account to it. Um, you can link up your iBooks. You can, uh, if you use a read it later service like Instapaper, or pocket one of these things where you like clip web articles to a like offline read it later kind of thing where it like strips out all the advertisements and and, and all that stuff well what you can take all these reader apps and then you can link them to your readwise account and then what readwise does is it surfaces all of your notes and highlights across all these different reading surface all these different reading tools and then uh what it can do is it can resurface them to you in a friendly little email or like you can search them. Um, but what I really like that it does is it also has export options as well. And it can automatically save your notes and highlights to something like Evernote um, or Obsidian, which we'll talk about in a minute. I know that there's a craft uh, extension mm. in the works um, that is, uh, you know, that you can use. And basically what it's doing is it's taking everything you highlight across all these different web articles, books, um, it'll also do, you can drag and drop a PDF into your Readwise account and it will take the highlights and notes out of that. So all these different areas where you might be reading things, it's taking and aggregating all of your highlights and notes into one space. And then it's able to save it automatically to a place that is, you know, your PKM app, your second brain, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, where it can then be linked meaningfully to other bits of data that you have yourself input. Yeah. And again, it gets into that idea of automation as a pathway to greater ability to manage all this stuff. You know, I, I use Readwise um, mainly for my, my Kindle and for scholarly articles as I'm doing research because I have it hooked up through my web browser that will export my highlights there into Readwise. And then it'll send it into, uh, used to send it to Rome. I got rid of my Rome subscription because their update cycle is a little weird, but it sends it to Notion for me. But I knew about Obsidian and I'm excited to hear about Craft too. I think Readwise is great because it, again, it resurfaces it in a number of different ways that you can modify to even where you get like, oh, here's five quotes for the day that you can look at and decide whether you want to keep them or not, or, you know, remind yourself. And it's almost like the, the forgetting curve where like, I want to be reminded about this 30 days from now, so I don't forget it. So it stays resident in my brain. You can set up Readwise to do something like that in a really powerful and honestly intuitive and simple way. Yeah. And, and I don't, again, don't want to be a spoiler of Obsidian, which is coming up in the outline, but um, my Obsidian database is all just a bunch of plain text files living on my computer and to have um, to, you know, that, that is information I've always longed for like the Kindle app on the Mac to be good enough that I could search it in the spotlight, you know, cause I can search a, a word inside of a Microsoft office document and like search the glo the key, you know, the entire computer globally hitting the command space bar and it'll surface documents that have those words I've searched inside of them. But Kindle is not really made with any of the Mac's good features in mind. And so mm -hmm. what this kind of effectively does is it's taking all of those things I've highlighted and, and taken notes on across all my reading, and it's created text files on my computer that contain the exact dates, so, um, the exact data from those quotes and notes. So like uh, there are now text files on my computer that contain the exact words that I've highlighted in my Kindle and in my online reading. So kind of a nice thing. It kind of integrates it into my computer system a little bit more. Again, Very much kind of so. Yeah. 
And for anyone who's tried to export your highlights from Kindle any other way, it is a, at best, frustrating and at worst, impossible task. So this kind of you know, cuts the Gordian knot a little bit, which is a really, really great thing. And the fact that it can kind of send it so many different places, depending on your use case, makes it all the more powerful. It's not just a, it only sends to one or it only does one thing. It's, it's a bit of a Swiss army knife in terms of distribution of your information, which I think, like you said, is a really powerful thing for you to have access to um, in such an easy to use and honestly kind of transparent sort of setup that, that uh, it sets up for you. All right. The next one on the list is air. This is a po the podcast app, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, and air, honestly, I, I used it for a long time. And then I started noticing that I wasn't actually using the things I saved. So I kind of moved away from it for a little while, <clears throat> but I know it's there. So if I need it, I can pull it back up. What it essentially does is you are listening. You have to listen to the podcast in the app. So it's like a podcast, uh, like a, like Stitcher or um, any of those, you know, Apple podcasts, any of those sorts of things, but it has this additional layer where if you want to save a segment, it will go through and you can highlight, like, I think it's up to a minute of the the podcast and it saves the audio file but it also clips out the text because either someone has already gone through and transcribed it or the podcast includes transcription in its metadata um and so you suddenly have the audio and the words saved for this little segment of you know maybe a two-hour podcast you're listening to you only wanted that one minute or you needed these several one minute segments you don't need to scrub to find it or write down the, the number anymore it's just there and the great thing about air is it syncs with readwise and it will send your um your clippings so to speak to wherever you want them to the same as it would do for your ibook or your kindle it's it's very cool my only issue with this is that it is good at that one thing in my brief experience, but it is, it doesn't function the way I otherwise want a podcast player. Right. Right. It's, it's, it's pretty limited. It's a really great sort of tool, but like you said, it's really good at that one thing and everything else is kind of like, eh, there's better solutions out there. So here's hoping that they get bought out by someone and that functionality ends up in a more full fledged app. Right. Because speaking of trying to eliminate extra brain effort, <laughs> um, I, I really like a podcast player that's easy to use. And for me, I, I really like one called Overcast. Mm -hmm. What I like about it is, um, again, the, just the experience of using it is a little cleaner, a little nicer than a lot of the other things that are out there. Um, it has really, really great, like a solid audio engine, which makes the, the voice easier to listen to, especially if you're like a 1.5 or a 2x speed listener, which I am. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I don't often want to clip the audio to a permanent place, but when I do, I really do. And so that's the kind of the frustration. It's right. It's like, do I really want to use another podcast player for something that I really want, but only like 1% of my podcast listening time? Right. And I mean, that's, I, I think the thing though is that we're seeing the rich media ecosystem grow exponentially. Like podcasting was kind of a, a dalliance like 10 years ago. And now it's, it's, as prevalent as radio, I think even maybe even more so in some people's experience and things like TikTok and YouTube are only going to become more, they might not stay on those platforms, but that idea of citizen journalism and citizen science and just kind of the, the conversations that happen in those, we're going to need a way to capture that just like we would a book or a newspaper article or something like that. So the functionality I think is fantastic and the, the user interface and the, the experience, the human computer interface is developing because it's, it's a weird thing, right? We're so used to, we've been in this paradigm of all the knowledge in the world is written down on these pieces of paper with ink for hundreds of years. And we're just maybe 20 years into this new space where it's that plus all these other things that we're still finding our feet as a society and as humans because the tools we use shape our brain. It, it adapts how we think about things. And so we're finding our way forward iteratively like we have for hundreds of years. It's just, we're kind of seeing it in real time because we have the data to know, okay, it could be better. We want this X, Y, Z to happen. And it's, it's a slow process. It's kind of frustrating, but I think it's pointing a way towards something that's going to be really valuable for all of us come, you know, a more mature realization of these technologies. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. Well, craft is next on the list and craft. I mean, I have a whole episode on craft with Dr. David McDonald and I'll just, I'll link that in, in the notes because I think that um, this one has a friendliness to it. it it's not like as, um, uncomfortable like to start out using it it's a little bit more readily like obvious how to use it 
and uh, to most teachers. And uh, even though it is very much um, developed with the Mac and iOS devices in mind, they do have a very, very great web app. They're constantly iterating on their collaborative features, which I would argue to me are sort of the two defining strengths of Craft. Um, Craft is very friendly, very pretty to look at. It's just a, it, a lot, um, unlike some of these tools, it has uh, prioritized the look and feel and experience of the software design over the features. And then that's not to say it can't do things. It acts because of that, and because it uses Apple's technologies, it can do some things the native that are native to Apple's platforms that none of these other apps can do. For example, the Apple Pencil can draw a handwritten drawing or note right inside of a craft document. Um, and so it, it definitely gets points in my book for being that way. Um, it, it actually kind of a meta point here. It, the Mac version is actually made using the Catalyst technology. It's actually the iPad app, but hmm. using Apple's technology for porting. Yeah, and, and a lot, sometimes you can tell uh, if an iPad app has been ported to the Mac um, because it looks and feels like an iPad app on the Mac. Right. But you've done so much work to make it feel like a totally unique experience to the Mac. And I just, it gets so many points in my book for being this awesome experience. And then on the other end of it, it's, I would say the easiest one of these tools to like share information um, because any note, and, and you can do all the same stuff that some of these other tools do with like tagging or like um, backlinking, connecting one note to another note, making your own little personal wiki of thought information. But then you can just quickly, quickly click a button and get a, a shared secret URL that you can text message or email to anyone or even put inside of your Canvas course. Mm -hmm. like, a lot of these learning management programs are so cumbersome to use that well, not to mention my, my band program, our, our music team has a website for our, like for our whole music program. And a lot of like the, we're using Squarespace, great, you know, great web site editor tool for anyone who wants to make an easy website, but like, it's still like a web app. So it's like not, doesn't function at a high level all the time. Sometimes we lose data. If the tab mm -hmm. crashes, it's really clicky and fiddly craft is like, this very smooth native experience to all of your devices, but then you can share this information on the web with just a simple URL and they look good. They look very, mm -hmm. very appealing, easy to read. And it's for this reason that a lot of the just basic information that was on our school's website or in my learning management software, I'm actually just starting to move a lot of that to craft documents and then sharing the URL and you know, I just link out to it. Right. Because it's so much easier to edit that data because it's just as simple as editing a document on my computer, not like logging into a website, waiting for it to load, using a weird editor. It's just so much more streamlined. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a big fan of Craft. If you want more ideas about how to use it, um, I would recommend anyone to go listen to that other episode. Yeah, I think they definitely should go listen to the other episode because that even gave me ideas. Craft is the one of the tools that I'm newest to. I've known about it for a long time. And I've used it here and there, but I haven't really dove in and, and seen how it might work in my in my kind of day-to-day. -day. And I agree with you. I think it, it's a really friendly app in terms of how we interact with it, but also how we can share things and how we can distribute the information we come up with and create. Um, and it's, it's just, it's dead simple. It seems I haven't found a place where it breaks and where it's just like, oh, that's way more difficult than it needs to be, which we all kind of come across in various apps, especially when we're using them for our own purposes that are highly idiosyncratic. Um, the other thing about Craft though, that, I, that I really like is how dead simple it is to not have instructions and go in and bumble around and still create something that's workable, useful, and powerful. To me, I think, you know, a lot of times we as teachers and we as people run into the situation where the time it's going to take to learn the tool outstrips our desire or available time to devote to that. We need to get things done. And I think craft and notion to a degree are friendly enough. They look enough like other things we've used, but they have extensions that are easy to find as you're fiddling with stuff that it's a, a really easy learning curve for kind of the, the new user into this space to still be able to get a lot of the benefit we, we're talking about with other, these other PKM apps that are maybe a little bit more fiddly or a little bit more techie or a little bit more like you can get in and mess around with the innards. These just kind of run. It's like Macintosh, honestly, like you mentioned, it's built on the, the Macintosh platform. They just work. And you might, I mean, I don't think any of them are obscenely expensive, but there might be a higher cost associated with that. But the thing just works. And that is valuable to us in a lot of ways as teachers, because again, less energy to get a good result equals more adherence to using that tool. 
Yeah. And I'll say, by the way, I had not actually put in the outline uh, um, that we would cover like the business model of each of these tools, but I will say that most of them are like a free tier with some stuff that you subscribe to. Yeah. Craft being one of those. And I do subscribe to craft and I, I think craft's limitation is typically like how much data you can. Right. Yeah. The, and um, honestly, the, I think like even something like notion, if you have a, a if you have a at edu address, I think you get a free version or at least when I signed up, you did, I don't know if that's still a, a feature, but like until you get into more data or more people interacting, it tends to be free or incredibly cheap because they understand the way they're going to make money is at scale, not from individual people, which is, is a smart and for us as consumers, more cost effective paradigm to live within. Yeah, exactly. And I'll say that since um, the some of the other things that are coming up on this outline are very extensible and can um, where the user can install additions to the app that other users have created, um, I will say that Craft is, I think, is seeing that this is happening a across a lot of the powerful PKM apps and is working on something they call extensions with a capital X. And they are uh, working, they have actually a Slack that I'm a part of hmm. where um, they're working with the customers, you know, de both people developing these extensions and also the users to just kind of figure out like how I think they, re they released this, you know, kind of a preview of this and it only works on the Mac version, but a couple people built some things pretty early on where they were like, whoa, what you're building is like blowing our minds. We need to like rethink this and make it even more open and more flexible for you all. Um, there's a really cool one that um, can integrate the shortcuts app into hmm. And shortcuts from with us inside a craft note. Um, there's one that will actually sync your to doist tasks to your note to a note. Oh wow! You're using the task at to doist, and again, this is the strength of things that are built on the web. Like to doist is not. I don't use it because I don't like the, the Mac app. Feels like it's a web browser just inside of a window. Yeah. Um, but because it is built on the web, you can you know this things like this can exist where basically you can be in craft and say like you know I think I want to bring in some checkable to dos that are like you know on my date to do list for the day for to do is you click a button, import them right in, and then you're kind of, and then, and then they crawl, they actually back sync. So if you check one off in craft and then click the sync button, it like checks them off on your to do list account as well. Um, and they've got somebody's working on a read wise thing as well to bring in all of your highlights and notes. So there, I like, I like the direction they're going. Um, I kind of like that, you know, they're very, you can tell that they're like very, very seriously and vigorously iterating on what is already a very complete and exciting product. Yeah, that's I, I didn't know about any of those, those new developments, and that's really exciting to hear. I'm glad that I'm glad they're listening to the users because not every app, and we'll get to some that, that seem not to listen to the users very much, but also that they're kind of looking in that direction of like what are the people wanting and using and creating and adapting the the iterations to reflect that. I, I, that's just smart development, I think, let alone smart business. Yeah, I love it. There's there's apps that I use that are not are, that arguably are not even like the ones that I recommend. To most people, but I use them almost solely because they have great developer consumer relations and great channels for communicating. Um, mm -hmm. OmniFocus has a Slack as well, and I'm beta testing the fourth version of that app right now and, and have been for a while. And for the better part of the year, they've just been like pushing out updates on that beta and like totally, completely listening to the user feedback inside of the Slack. And um, I mean, there are things that I've, that have come into the app that are things that like I and other members of that Slack have recommended as changes. And it's like, if you can argue a good reasoning for why something should be the way it is, then, you know, you're not just because they're the software developers doesn't mean they aren't listening. If you can create a good case, then you might, you might see it in your favorite piece of software. Right. It's kind of like the uh, a riff on that old Steve Job quotes of the, the rules are made up by people no smarter than you or I. And so if the rule needs to be changed, we can step up and do that. That kind of spins it into, if we need more features, the developers don't know what they don't know until we tell them. And there are people just like us that just happen to be really good at, you know, putting letters and numbers together to create a, a piece of software. We need to tell them what we need or else they aren't going to do it. It's funny you mentioned Steve Jobs because I'm reading Creative Selection by Ken Kajenda right now, hmm. who is uh, used to work at Apple and he developed Safari, the web browser on all Apple platforms. And he developed the, amongst other things, he's, I think one of his big contributions was he developed the keyboard for the first iPhone. Oh, wow. Okay. On screen software keyboard. And so he kind of writes about like the first years that Steve Jobs was back after he was gone from the company and like the iPod, like iMac, iPhone, iPad era, sort of like that, that decade. And um, there's an interesting story of him in the intro of the book of him pitching the iPad keyboard design 
to Steve Jobs and it being only like his second or so product demo for um, and, and feeling very threatened and intimidated by uh, by him and and having walked into this um, into this to give this demo of the progress on the keyboard his his boss like his senior manager had pitched the idea well what if we have like an iPad keyboard on screen that fits all of the keys of a laptop keyboard into a condensed space but then if you want to kind of get them the keys bigger to more like the same size of an actual laptop keyboard you can pr press a zoom button that will basically like change the layout of the keyboard to what actually is the ship one that shipped on the iPad which is like less stuff on the screen but bigger and more easy to tap mm -hmm. and uh, so he had developed the bigger keys his boss had helped develop this zoom feature to kind of change so he goes into demo the product for Steve and uh he shows off this zoom feature and uh Steve Jobs says okay well we obviously don't need both of these keyboards right so which one is it going to be and uh he knew he writes in that moment he's like I knew he was even though that I had worked on this feature with my, one of my managers like I knew that he was asking me because I was the one giving the demo and he wanted my opinion and so I told him I said I think that I've learned to adapt to the bigger keys and I think our users will too I think this is the way forward to make this a friendlier device and Steve Jobs was like okay we're shipping that one and then that was it <laughs> that was the end of the meeting it's incredible wow yeah, he, I, he I just, heard that story that's awesome I mean he was basically able to just you know I, and I think this is so true in every profession and this is sort of ex exterior to the topic of PKM but just I think like when you can create a good argument for your idea then anyone smart in the room who's listening will will know that that's the way forward <laughs> and that's right. the kind of the that I take from that. It doesn't matter who you are, how high up you are, how experienced you are, like a good idea will always prevail if you, add, sometimes you just have to advocate for that idea. Right, you have to advocate. And sometimes you need to change your audience too. Not everyone's gonna see the, the future in what you say, but people like Steve Jobs who are visionaries themselves can often recognize that really well. And, and we've run in situations where people just kind of don't get what we're saying, um, but it, it should make you value the times when they do and those things work and you are able to affect change. All the more it should make them more valuable and more more precious exactly yeah well do you want to talk about rome sure um rome to me is is kind of the og of uh pkm software in the current iteration evernote has been around for a long time and it it kind of serves a lot of the same purposes but rome in my experience was the first one i came across that used bi-directional linking in a really clear kind of central way um and what rome essentially is is a web-based database you create for yourself where you have notes that you can link them to other things through either tags or through actual like bi-directional linking where you do the, the double brackets around things and, and create kind of themes or topics and trends. The cool thing about Rome though is it is text forward but rich media friendly. Um, where it starts to be a little bit clunky is that it's trying to serve a lot of different purposes. It's designed for researchers, it's designed for computer scientists, it's basically designed for anybody who needs to store a lot of information in a way that they can combine and look at it in different ways. And so because of that, their development life cycle has been a little strange, their interaction with their users has been a little augmented in the sense that they aren't always responding to what the community is asking for. Um, but it is a really powerful tool, though a little expensive, for pure knowledge management, like text that is linked together and you iteratively kind of put all these little notes in and then start clicking through on your tags for whatever the, the notes were you put in, you can suddenly start to see, oh, I've come across like 15 things about this and three of them repeat. So maybe maybe I need to think about that before I do it. But also it suggests the, all these things are going to help me in whatever this thing is I'm trying to do, whether it's, you know, if we're talking about being a music teacher, it might be sight reading, it might be soul edge, it might be these tips and tricks we learn, but it also might be discovering something new in all of those relationships. Oh, I noticed that all the times I talk about sight reading, it comes from this one source, so maybe I need to look there more. It, it lets you notice things in, in conglomerate, really, because it creates the ability to group them together and see the sum total of your thoughts versus just the one note in a notebook that is maybe 45 pages later, there's another note, it reduces that distance. So that's, I think, the, the critical tool within Rome that makes it valuable and useful. That being said, it's on the expensive side, um, but it's also not fully mobile slash web slash, it's, it's a very sort of clunky interface that 
if you really like to get in the nuts and bolts of things is going to make you just light up like a Christmas tree. But for most of us who just don't have the time to dive into that or don't have the background to dive into that, it is a little scary because of how fiddly you can be with it. Yeah, yeah, totally. And actually the description you gave of like being text forward, but being friendly to other media, that's actually exactly how I would describe Obsidian, which is the next one on our list. Right. Obsidian seems to be pop, very popular with people who were using Rome, at least in the circles that I run in and the, the web forums and the communities that I'm around digitally. Um, so Obsidian, the way that I use it and the way that it kind of functions at its core is it is uh, an app. It's an experience. It's actually built using web technologies, kind of like Notion, but it's unlike um, running in a web browser. It actually is a standalone app that you can download and install for free. In fact, I would say that Obsidian has probably the most, can do the most for free of a lot of the things uh, on this list. There's a couple of really core things the way that I use it that have caused me to consider paying for it, which I'll get to in a second. But at its, at its uh, core, it is a, a, an experience that is basically just looking at a folder of playing text files on your computer. So very, very lightweight, um, not taking up a lot of storage text files that if you open them, they would just look like a string of characters. But um, but in Obsidian, they can have lots of rich formatting and context. Like for example, I could drag an image into a note and um, Obsidian uses the Markdown format, which I've got, a, I'll link a blog post I did on what Markdown is a while back. But basically it's a shorthand for um, formatting things. Kind of like, like if you're, you know, if you have a website and you've ever done any HTML, you know that you have to type a string of characters on either side of a word to make it bold. Well, Markdown, you just can put an asterisk on each side of a word. And then that can be by certain apps like Obsidian that can kind of be registered as making the word appear bold to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of like a syntax or a shorthand for HTML, but that is really useful if you want to be writing in text, not taking your fingers off the keyboard, but still mm -hmm. getting your document to look like, you know, it's got like different sized words for different levels of headings or bullet point lists or numbers or mm -hmm. tables or charts and things. So dragging an image into a, a note inside of Obsidian will effectively just basically link, create a markdown link to that note. So if you open the text file, you're just seeing like, you know, it's like an exclamation, exclamation point with like brackets and then a caption and then a link. But in your note, it actually looks like the image. So it feels kind of like you're dealing with a standard note app, but really it's just a bunch of text. And Obsidian has a lot of the same features we've talked about so far, backlinking, tagging. Um, it, Obsidian and also Craft kind of have a, are very forward about this feature called the daily note, which I am a mm -hmm. big user of. It's the idea that there's a calendar interface on the sidebar, and then you can click on a date and have like a note in your database that's just named basically that day. And my date titling format is like year dash month dash day. And what happens is you kind of get this like, I, this is really helpful for me. It's like kind of replace that need to have this like scratch pad of, as you mentioned earlier, like sort of discarded information is I can just take notes um, on, on different parts of my day. And then like, if I start a note, I can have, you know, link out to different notes I've created that day from within the daily note and sort of have a context of like, what are the things I did in this database that might not, that might be all different places of the database, but then mm -hmm. it happened on the day. How do I associate them with the concept of that of time? Like right. I did them on the day or I worked on them on this day. And, um, and that's been pretty powerful for me uh, because the other thing <laughs> that makes Obsidian great is it's got a very, very rich ecosystem of third-party plugins in a mm -hmm. developer community of people who are basically in the same way that if you're using uh, Logic or Ableton Live and you can like buy like an audio restoration plugin from the company Isotope that will take your voice and make it sound buttery smooth. Well, Obsidian has a free library of user-created plugins that change the way the app behaves mm -hmm. down to the way it looks because it's built on web technologies in the same way that my blog has like a certain text, um, it has like a certain fonts and certain um, colors to it. You can like using this library of themes, you can like theme Obsidian to look different ways you want or even program it to look different ways you want. Mm -hmm. You can add plugins that do things. I'm gonna just tell you a couple of my plugins that I have. So um, like, okay, so there's one plugin that like it's something as simple as just telling you how many words are in the document at the bottom of the document. Like that's a plugin somebody created. Another one uh, is called, uh, let's see here. Let me go ahead and look through this and talk. Okay, you mentioned Kanban boards earlier. Um, this plugin can take a markdown note. And what it can do is it can basically take a, take a markdown note with that has like different levels of headings, 
with sub with sub bullet points and then it can it display that to you like a kanban board where you can actually like drag the different um cards from one list to another and i'll link in uh, the communications episode i did back in february talks all about the app trello which is a, a kanban board app. So, so if you want one giant link, kanban board yeah basically right um, a couple of other plugins. Uh, one that I really like is, oh gosh, there's an attendance plugin. So mm. some of my Obsidian notes are just like, so I have a note in my Obsidian for every student. And the title of the document is the student's first and last name. And then the note is just a place where I can take notes on that student. So like mm -hmm. if I have a student who misses their weekly sectional pretty often, I can, sometimes what I'll do is just take a screenshot. It's really annoying to search their schedule in our Synergy program, which is like the web software for student data, I can just take a screenshot of their, sec their schedule for the day and put it in their note so that the next time they miss their sectional, I have a really quick at a glance way to remember what teacher's class they're in. Right. Um, and I, you know, you can type um, notes about them on a date. And so what's cool is the backlinking to the date helps too. Like, let's say that I have to call a parent home. I might have a note that where I take some notes from that conversation with the parent, like, hey, your child is maybe like, not like doing so well on you know, in turning in their work lately. And I might create a note called conversation with parent of this kid on this date. And then in the note, I can refer to the daily note and the kid note. And now all of those notes backlink to each other. And in the sidebar of each note, you can see every note that links to that note and every note that that note links out to. So that mm -hmm. you're creating a network of contextual ideas where a kid is no longer just a kid. A kid is a kid who has a parent who you had a conversation with, who has favored interests, who is in a certain class. And so this is where this stuff becomes kind of cool is like one of my notes, one of my documents on my computer is just a roster for each class. Well, now I can have those rosters live in Obsidian, but the names of the kids link directly to the notes by those kids' names. Mm -hmm. And this is really great with this attendance plugin because someone has made a plugin where you can basically take a little string of text and put it in a note and then all of the kids in your class have a little like check x like a basically like a present absent tardy button next to their names hmm. that you can click and it provides this little interface this is really useful for someone like me like our attendance tool is also synergy and it's really clunky it's not really easy to do it super fast but you have to do it super fast when there's 70 band kids mm -hmm. in your room um the Readwise plugin is the one that I have installed, which we talked about earlier, which just automatically takes all of your highlights and notes. Um, I have one that can pull in blo a blog feed into the mm. sidebar and allow me to like really quickly. So I actually subscribe to my own blog in this. And if I'm writing a blog post and I need to refer to an earlier blog post, I can really quickly find the URL for my earlier posts. Uh, and then things get kind of nuts. Like there's one called Data View, which um, I, I never actually, like they involve some coding. So I never actually make my own. I just steal them from other people uh, on the web. But basically I have one that uh, I put inside of my daily note that just basically gathers every note that I have edited that day, it just shows up with a link to it at the very bottom of my daily note. So if I ever am like, okay, I know I was working on this yesterday, but I can't remember what I titled it. Go to my daily note, scroll down. And then I have just a list of everything that I worked on. Oh, that's brilliant. That's great. It's really good and, and you can template so like my daily note let me t tell you actually my daily note is probably the strongest advocacy for uh for obsidian so if i'm in my daily note i'm going to a day where i actually taught school because you know it's summer break um so the top area of my daily note every day is called morning review and i have a data view little snippet that basically looks at any unchecked tasks from any previous day in any daily note and what that allows me to do is if it's the morning and I'm just starting my day, I can either really quickly do them if they're a couple minutes long or less, or if I don't think I'm going to get them done in a short time, I'll bring them into OmniFocus, which is my to-do app where I can kind of give them like a due date and a deadline. And then I have the school schedule below that. And then I have my sectional schedule below that. And then I have the daily agenda. And this daily agenda is, you can, you can link to another note, but if you put an exclamation point in front of the double brackets, you can actually have a note in, embedded inside another note. So my daily agenda is like its own note, but I see it in my daily note every day. Mm -hmm. And this is a markdown formatted note that tells me um, what it, I'm gonna do, like the order I'm gonna rehearse each band for the day. And what's cool about this is I use another app called Dexet, which is a presentation app, kind of like Keynote or PowerPoint, but that creates slides from markdown files. Mm. So. Mm -hmm. 
my daily agenda where I decide the order that I'm going to rehearse the music and share with the students the sectional schedule for the day, that is all in the note called daily agenda. So I see it in plain text when I'm looking at my daily note and I teach from it. That's kind of what I have up on my iPad at the front of the room. But my Mac, the Dexet app is like looking at that note and generating a slideshow presentation from it. So mm -hmm. I have these like really rich and engaging fun slides that kind of show the kids what to take out when they sit at their seats. And that's happening, editing that same data in one place mm -hmm. rather than two. Um, and then I have uh, notes and tasks for each class, but all the class names are double bracketed so I can click into a roster for any class right from within that daily note. And then I have my little like notes modified at the bottom. So this is just like one kind of cool way that I'm using it to create some context between days and times mm -hmm. and students and classes. Well, I think one of the things you highlight in there, because that's like, that is makes me want to actually learn more about the city and just listening to you talk about that because I use it in a different way. I use it more as a because we I live in Houston and we have roughly 80 school districts in the area and those, those school districts all have lots of band directors and I'm the instrumental music guide guy so I have to know all of them. But to me, it's almost like baseball cards. You need to know who's where and who teaches with who and those sorts of things where they went to school. So my obsidian is just all the band directors in Houston, like their their names, their email addresses, their pictures, when I can get them their backgrounds um, so I can make those connections. But what you're talking about, I think, is even more powerful for especially people that are classroom teachers, because you're able to do something in one spot and have it affect three or four different areas from that one like your daily agenda shows up here and here and here because of the tools you have set up to me that like that is the the killer app the killer way of using that app um and really a lot of these other tools we're talking about have the flexibility to do that the the extensions are something that i think every app that has an open back end that people can develop on like an api of uh, the automated program interface that um, will allow people to go in and monkey with stuff. Rome has it, it's similar, it's, it's very much code heavy. Um, Notion has extensions, like people make money selling Notion templates. That's like their, one of their like side hustles. Obsidian is, is huge. Craft, like you said, is developing one. All of these, if we sit down and spend a little time going, okay, what do I need to do? And what is the fastest way to solve this problem? in my app of choice, there's probably gonna be a solution that either you can adapt to your needs or is already done for you. Like the attendance feature I think is, is brilliant and the ability to bring in things you didn't get done the, the previous day is like, again, these are all really powerful tools that should make anyone who feels overwhelmed, which is most of us, by our daily, just like the, the grind of attendance and following up and reaching out to parents and doing all those things, this just gives you so much more power because it allows you to basically combine all your knowledge of whatever it is you're doing in a really clear and easy to find way once you know your system. Yeah, and that's exactly how I feel about it. And I, I did, I mean, I've spent some considerable time learning this. I will link in the show notes, the, there's like four or five articles that were published on a website called maxstories.net where the uh, editor in chief of that blog like kind of went all in on this as like a writing tool for writing that, you know the content of that website and uh, he talked a lot about his setup like how to make it look nice and get some basic plugins from the get-go and understanding how it works so I'll, I'll link those in the notes those helped me but yeah i mean i'm mostly just exploring plugins and kind of keeping there's a discord uh for in, a, in an online forum user forum where you can kind of stay up to date on you know what plugins people are making and every now and then you know i mean there are a lot of people in education using this that's where the attendance plugin comes from and i'm not mm -hmm. going to make that i don't know how to do any you know i think javascript is what a lot of the obsidian yeah. plugins are but i i you know someone but someone else can make it and, and the community is so responsive like i i can write like um someone in a discord uh that i'm in wrote a plugin where if you put a url link to something in a note it'll just it'll embed it like show it as an embed in your note so like mm -hmm. Um, so if I dump a YouTube link in, it'll actually like show up with a play button that you can play the YouTube video right from Oh, the nice. Notes. And he was like, hey, does anybody have any other websites where they would want this? Because basically what it, it's not different than putting the HTML embed code mm -hmm. inside of the note. Obsidian is built using web technology. So it's able to take HTML and show it to you as if you're looking at actual like parsed out code, like, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a what you see is what you get. Um, but that's, you know, it, get, finding the embed code for stuff is kind of cumbersome. So I said, hey, you know, I use an app called NoteFlight and Flat 
for um, which are web-based tools for music notation. Do you think you could take a stab at those? And like within days, he was like, try it. And I took a NoteFlight URL to a little you know, musical example I was working on in NoteFlight, pasted it into my Obsidian Note, and then the full like NoteFlight player showed up inside of my Obsidian Note. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, that plugin is called Simple Links, I believe. Uh, and I'll, I'll link to that. Like I'm, I'm, just geeking, I'm just geeking out over here because like I there's a lot of this I haven't explored very much so it's it it makes me really happy that people out there are responsive but it also points out that this this kind of Cambrian explosion of technology that we're there that we're living in right now and have really been since the 90s is something that is can become bespoke because more people have access to the tools to create stuff and if we don't personally have it someone out there might have the time and the expertise to just cobble this together like it's nothing for them they would treat this like we would treat you know marking up a score or practicing an excerpt or practicing an etude it's like that's just normal for us it would be alien to them flip it around and that's what we're looking at and i think that's a really powerful thing about having access to things like discord and slack where you get to communicate with the people who are using the tool but also the people who are actually developing the tool and the the benefits we see from that compound very quickly and very powerfully yeah exactly exactly that's what gets me so excited about about the software i actually want to tell you one more kind of crazy workflow i'm working on in yeah. but I we could do it maybe after we cover the rest of the things on sure. this list sure definitely i don't know this next one at all so but athens yeah. athens is to me a friendlier version of um rome it's a very similar sort of technology platform. It's fully open source. It is crowdfunded. It's it's not seeking to be bought out or anything. And it, it does a lot of the same things as Rome. It's just one, a lot less expensive. And two, the developers, I think, have a lot more focus on the things that we that we've talked about that people that use Obsidian, that develop craft, like they want to respond to what the user base needs. Whereas Rome, I think, has kind of a, what I would call an a priori sort of mindset of this is what needs to happen and we're going to realize it regardless of what people think or people what people think they want. We're going to give them what they want before they know they want it, which is that very much that Steve Jobs sort of mindset that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Athens is that same sort of paradigm of a, a, a database, a relational database, um, with bi-directional links that you can use to create larger knowledge structures. Um, and it it kind of does a lot of the same stuff Rome does, but in a more friendly way, they are, I think, developing a, a mobile app, but right now it's in beta on Mac and Windows and maybe Linux. Uh, it's really straightforward, really simple, and kind of very basic in terms of here's some text and this is what you do. The downfall to Athens and to an extent, Obsidian is that they're mostly local. You can't, or they're not set up automatically to be shared across multiple machines or across multiple platforms just by the way they're constructed. Um, that was one of the things a lot, when I was doing my reading a couple of years ago when I was getting into this, Obsidian was for people who didn't want their stuff out on the web. They, they didn't want to host it up in the cloud. They wanted it to stay with them and be encoded and encrypted and whatever they wanted it to be. And that's one of the benefits of Obsidian. But if you need to have access to multiple computers, it's less of a good solution in that way, unless you want to pay for it. I know that's a, a feature that they're working on or maybe have already released. I haven't seen the, the updates for that. Athens is similar. It, it can be used on multiple systems, but it gets really clunky. And it's, because it's in beta, there are often errors and weird stuff happens that you need to go back and fix. But for me, Athens is kind of the, the friendlier, maybe a little bit more pro-social version of Rome. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And maybe that's what some people are looking for. So I'm glad you brought it to my attention. Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to talk about two real quick here that are like, um, gosh, they're not they're not quick apps to cover, but yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try to do it. They're uh, they're both really these two are like really um, just for the for the Apple people out there. Um, and I would describe them as kind of well. Let me say first the first of these is drafts, and I've actually had the developer of drafts, Greg Pierce, on this show long long ago, and I'll link that episode in the notes to this. But I will say drafts is a uh, a, a text note app for Apple platforms, uh, where basically the, the idea is that when you launch it, you're taken to a plain white blank space for writing with no distractions. And it's just sort of like this attitude of like getting information out of sight, out of mind. It's like for, for your second brain, it's that part of the process where it's like you need to just take what's in your brain and immediately as quickly as possible 
get it into something. And what Draft does is it makes it really easy to get information into, but then it has uh, very powerful extensions that you can use to get information out of it and directly into the place you want it to go without having to like copy and paste and fiddle around with different apps. Um, so I'm looking at my drafts. It's called the action list. It's basically just a, a list of, you know, I treat drafts like an inbox. It's where all my thoughts go, but then I don't leave a lot in there. I mostly export it out. And just an example of a couple of my drafts actions They're you know, they're common apps. So I've got one that'll take a draft and send it as a to do to the reminders app on my phone, um, or that will take a list of items and save it to my grocery list in the reminders app. I've got one for saving it a task to my OmniFocus. I've got one for copying whatever it is to my clipboard. One for sending it as an event to my calendar. One for um, saving it to my journal app day one. One for saving it, uh, starting an email to someone with the text in the body of the email. So like you can just kind of like send it different places. You can, uh, you know, there's actions uh, in a user directory where you can, you don't have to design or create them yourself. You can, if you want to, and you want to get your hands dirty, but you can also just install ones from the user community. And uh, so there, I know that there's some notion ones where you can like, you know, get your drafts to go straight into different areas of your notion mm -hmm. database. Um, and just like tons of things that can tweet and post to social media, like just tons, tons and tons of actions. Um, so for me, it's a great way of getting stuff in it. And you know, the developer has added some of these PKM features recently for people who do want to keep stuff more permanently in drafts. Uh, it certainly is all plain, in plain text. So it's, you know, you can, it's really light and easy to search. Um, it's cool because it's kind of a secondary place I have since most things start there and then end up somewhere else. Sometimes it's a great place, secondary place to go looking for an earlier thought. And it actually, when you save it, send it somewhere, it like timestamps it. So you can see like, okay, what app did I send this into and when, when you're looking through your archive notes. And then you can create uh, these interconnected links with the double brackets that are becoming so popular. Uh, it also supports tagging. So, I mean, it can be kind of like your all in one note plain text zone. Um, unlike something like Obsidian, it does not save the notes anywhere that is accessible to you or exposed to you in the file mm -hmm. system. It's all living inside of drafts. Um, but that's kind of like my, I treat it kind of like a mental inbox. Uh, and then Devon Think is, uh, have you used Devon Think before? I, I started using it for a while and went like, okay, this is way more than I can learn right now because I think it was the middle of the semester. So I, it's it's on my computer, just unused. Yeah, I would say that I'm using like 10% of what it can do, but it's it sort of has replaced for me everything that I used to use Evernote for that is not text. So mm -hmm. uh, clipped web clippings, emails that I want clipped to a separate place, um, files. What's cool about it is that you can pretty much take anything you throw at it. Um, mm -hmm. It, it's got an archival tool for your Apple Notes, your Evernote database. Uh, it can import context, calendar events, your bookmarks in Safari or Chrome. Like you can just get any kind of data you want into it. Mm -hmm. And then it's got lots of automation, like easy um, web cl and email clipping tools. So like it's got some uh, scripts you can use if you're using Apple Mail to like get messages into it real quick. And it, like a lot of these tools, it has this sort of inbox attitude where like things go into a folder called inbox and then you sort of sort them into different, it, it sort of functions with like different databases. I actually just use one database for almost all of my stuff. And it's kind of cool because, um, you know, it's it's nice to have, it, it definitely has some automation friendly features, but you can also plug an RSS feed into it. So like I have my blog posts all archived there and it can even, um, it, can, it can kind of look at a file part a folder of files on your computer and index them so like it's not like you're copying and pasting them it's more like it's just sort of looking at the text and the metadata inside of them and you can take both websites emails f files um you know indexed files from your computer's file system all of these different kinds of data can be sort of meaningfully grouped together into they call them groups. They should just call them folders because in every way, functionally, they are folders, but they're called groups. Right. And what I love about this is I can create context between the files I'm working on, but also like other kinds of data. So for example, if I am uh, taking my band to our March band assessment, um, I likely have, maybe I have like a percussion list of equipment that I'm gonna have the students pack up and be responsible for. And that's created in pages because it's I made it pretty to, to print on the wall in the back of the room. Um, maybe I've got like 
seating chart from the event coordinator all filled out, but that's in Microsoft Word. Uh, I've got maybe like a couple of websites where I had a Google form where I had to fill out like how many kids are going so that the, you know, the, our music coordination um, can like figure out how many buses send us. So I've got like web emails floating around, emails, websites, files, um, PDFs, all this stuff can go inside of a group in DevonThink. And then I have this like one place that sort of aggregated all this different content from different places where otherwise I would be like in a web browser tab over here and I would be in an email app over here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so DevonThink also has exceptional searching tools. And it's for this reason that I kind of actually, DevonThink is not only itself really good at kind of creating context between different data, but it is itself part of what I'm calling the, um, calling, calling, I, guess, I think, I, I forget, I don't know who coined this term, but I, I, I've heard uh, David Sparks over at the Mac Power Users podcast has called this like the super app, which is basically the idea of taking a couple of apps and sort of like by the power of their extensibility, sort of like linking them together. <laughs> and so for me, it's like Obsidian is sort of for like t notes. Devon Think is sort of for like all other kinds of data. Um, OmniFocus is for the actual projects with checkable to-dos. And because mm -hmm. any one of those apps can take a piece of content I'm looking at and generate a URL link that'll take me directly into it, I can sort of string these. It's like creating, it's like a trail of breadcrumbs, or I, I joke that it's like just duct tape. Um, basically, like I can have a note in Obsidian that says, hey, everything associated with this note click this button here and it actually will take me straight into a group of content inside of Dev and Think. Or mm -hmm. like a task in OmniFocus can like say, hey, uh, email this parent. And I can have a draft of that email in a note in Obsidian, which can be in the notes field of the task. It'll click me straight into that draft in Obsidian. So kind of like just creating these little con kind of contextual clues and uh, trails here is kind mm -hmm. of where, that's kind of the space I'm living in these days. I don't know, what do you think? Do you do any of that? I, I want to, I want to do more and I, I think I don't have quite the uh, the ecosystem and the, the workflow that you do um, for me on, on this side of things, but the appeal of what you're talking about makes me want to do more, I'll be honest. Um, the, and the thing about Devon Think and uh, all these other like drafts, especially, what they suggest is that we're looking at, we're looking at ways to network our thought in, in a way that reflects our needs and our, our use case. And so, you know, one of the things I used to feel really good about back in the dark ages when I was teaching band before any of this was, because I stopped teaching in the classroom after the 2009, 2010 school year. So a lot of this stuff really wasn't fully featured, like Evernote was out, but it wasn't what it is now. And these other things didn't exist. But one of the things I really enjoyed was when we were able to take, you know, the, the class roster and the percussion list and the, the flow of the, the contest or the, the thing we're going to, condense them into one packet that I could give to parents and kids. So any question they had was answered in that packet. Now they didn't always look at it. We all know that about kids, but at the same time, we had access to that. Everything was in there and what things like drafts and Devin think and all these other apps are able to do is do that at scale, do that automatically. So when you open it up, you know, these things are going to be in there because you set automations or you just did it in a quick second all the stuff you need to answer the question in the situation you're in is right there, which I don't know about you, but for me, when I'm in front of a group, the last thing I want to be thinking about is where is that one thing that I wanted to do? Where is that one thing I wanted to talk to them about? I forget, I don't know what I did. And then you spiral, this kind of cuts that out and allows you to have everything in one place way ahead of time that you don't have to be thinking about during the passing period. It's just going to be there persistent and resident where you put it because that's the way digital digital tools work. So these workflows you're talking about, I think are, are fantastic. The one thing I would want to caution people against is thinking that if you're new to this space, you need something quite as built out as that. Like something as simple, like we said before, Apple notes <laughs> and you send the note, you email it to yourself can be a way to do personal knowledge management that is powerful because it cuts out a lot of the other work that you might be having to do of copy paste remembering you take your brain and you digitally export it that's what this second brain concept is you kind of live in both worlds to whatever extent you're comfortable with but also to whatever extent you need you know if you don't have a lot that you need to manage you don't need all these tools if you have a ton you have a giant band program and you're the only person you're going to need more of these tools because it makes your life easier and better yeah that's a great point I'm going to totally, I, I can't agree with you more. I'm going to totally, though, now go in the opposite extreme and tell you the craziest thing I've yes. built in the position so far. I love right. these. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so uh, 
how do okay uh, what what are the things that has been a common both pedagogical and technological thread on my music team is using uh, technology to create mastery based sequences of instruction that make it easier for students to develop skills on instruments mm -hmm. and from point A to point B in the most streamlined and, uh, you know, internally and even externally, if we play with that external motivation as well in this process to try to like kind of take every possible way of motivating a kid to take their instrument out of the case and sort of sequence that in, appropriate, in an appropriate way, but that also makes transparent feedback available to the student and the families. Um, we've tried a lot of different things. I will link in the show notes. If you want to go back and listen to me and my orchestra teaching colleague, Ben Denny, talk about how we used FileMaker. Um, the pandemic did not, uh, well, I'll, I'll say this, uh, pause this episode, go listen to that episode <laughs> and then come back. <laughs> and uh, and you know, we are, I will tell you, we are not using that anymore because um, one of the things it did was, you know, we, a lot of the data on student performance was collected in FileMaker, but it was a lot of it was not really accessible to the student, which became a big problem during the pandemic, where we were seeing them less face to face. Mm -hmm. um, so when we were like we did a, we did a whole year of online instruction and giving them face to face feedback, which is the most meaningful kind of feedback, mm -hmm. uh, was not easy to do. So it kind of made us think, okay, well, how do we get some of this in our LMS Canvas? Well, Canvas sucks at doing everything. <laughs> so, so we kind of, you know, I, we we kind of gave up on some of our, you know, very very built up uh, relational database stuff. But as this past year has progressed, you know, I I introduced um, my colleague to Craft, and I've been sort of using Obsidian, and we've been, you know, he kind of immediately got off the ground with giving putting student notes in Craft and then sharing the student note with them, at, mm. using the secret URL, and then having the feedback for each performance be less. Uh, quantitative and more qualitative and, and mm -hmm. playing so that they can read it. And I really like this. I struggled with this for a couple of reasons. Number one, I was kind of feeling out what I want craft to be for, what I want Obsidian to be for. I'd ultimately love to have one of these tools, not two. Um, Obsidian is able to publish to the web, but it's not like you can just take a note. First of all, it's paid. Um, right. And I am currently paying for that feature, but it's not like you can just take a note and then send it to the web and get a link copied to your keyboard. You kind of have to go into this publish mode and then you sort of publish a group of things at once. And I think what it wants to think of that as is that you're sort of publishing a group of related information where all of it's supposed to be exposed to the same person, like a, like a little mini Wikipedia kind of page. Mm -hmm. um, what I, I don't want that because I don't want students poking around in other people's notes super easily, right? And so I want to be able to have my own local system that connects all this student stuff with all the different class rosters and with all the different data and performances. Uh, and I'm finally, I think I've finally gotten it to the point where I can effectively publish this information without students be able to, being able to click around. Um, it's just, it's more cumbersome than craft, but it is possible. So what I'm doing is I think for next school year, I'm going to have a student note that's shared with every student. They have a link that they can get to and what I do is when they perform something in this sequence, and this is like a sequence of like 40 or so songs that we would assess in their pullout sectionals. Um, each of them has a five point rubric. Mm -hmm. It's binary. So they get the point or they don't. And the criteria rotates. So like the, for the earlier assignments, they're playing something very easy, but um, the criteria might be like, are you, the point one is, are you sitting on the edge of your seat? Point two is, did you take a deep relaxed breath? Um, you know, only one or two of the, of the points will be, you know, a, a huge ask for them, like consistent, steady, clear tone production or something mm -hmm. like this. And so what we've done with this in the past is once, once they hit a certain number of points within a certain number of songs, kind of like, you know, when you play Mario, you need to, you can get to the next world with 20 mm -hmm. stars, but if you, you know, that's not all of the stars. <laughs> um, they, they can get to the next world or packet of songs, so to speak, only once they've received a certain number of stars out of the possible. Mm -hmm available criteria so then they love they kind of level up they get harder music and the sequence continues on and on well what i'm going to be doing for next school year is i've built uh a, a number spreadsheet that logs every student so it's not relational it's just like a row of student names and then columns of assignment names and then mm -hmm. a little star rating of basically a number between one and five zero and five how many points do they get when they play that and the idea is that it cannot take performance records of each instance like the relational database could but it will show at least the most recent score they got on every song they've played. And then what I'm doing is an obsidian. When I'm looking at the student note, 
like imagine I'm like in the class with the kid and let's, let's say that like um, Ellie is about to play a flute song. Um, I am using a plugin a created, that is also created by the MacStories.net people that will take a note in Obsidian that I'm looking at and will run the title of it through a shortcut in the Shortcuts app. And then what my shortcut will do, hold on, I gotta pull it up. It took me like a whole weekend to figure out. It has some Apple script in it. Ooh. Um, okay. What did I call it? It's called mastery. Here we go. Okay. So what, what this, it's got 41 actions in the shortcut. Okay. So what it'll do is it will prompt me to say, what song are they going to perform? And then I'll get a little selectable menu of songs. I choose the song. And then what it does is it automatically will open up because I'm creating an, a note in Obsidian for every song. And that contains the criteria and a little table. Mm -hmm. um, the two recommended metronome marking and tuning drone because we recommend the total energy tuner app uh -huh. and then what it'll do is it's going to have i'm creating a play along track that combines to justly and tune tuning drones with the tempo markings so that they rather than fiddling with tonal energy they just hit a play button and then they right from their web browser they can get some a practice track that they can uh -huh. practice along to so that opens for me when I run the shortcut because I want to be able to also have them play along to that track. So I hit the play button, they start playing, and then the shortcut presents me another menu that basically says it's checkboxes, like which of the five possible points did they or did they not get? So I check, let's say they got point one, two, and five. I check those. And then what it does is it goes into the numbers spreadsheet, cross-references the song's title with the kid, updates the star count to whatever I just scored, Mm -hmm. And then it puts a clipping of text into the Obsidian note for that kid, telling them which points they did and didn't get on that song on that date. And all of these are backlinked. So the date is backlinking to my daily note. The title of the song that they just played is linking to the song. And then their name is linking to their name. So no matter what, if they're looking at this note of themselves, they can really easily like go back, like link to the song. Like if they're looking at their note and saying like, okay, uh, well, last Thursday I played song number one and I only got star one and two, I better go practice that. And then they can just click once to get straight to that song with all the available resources. Oh, and they also have embedded note flight examples in them too to sh for the sheet music. So they can click a play button from each song's page and like hear what it would sound like. Um, so that's kind of the idea is that like a shortcut is sort of like updating a number spreadsheet and going to the web and then none of the daily notes are actually published so they, there's no way they can link to all of that personal data that i collect but right the idea here is that in relatively few clicks and taps um, i've sort of created my own learning management for mastery because you know we don't put this stuff at least i don't put this stuff in canvas because i don't want kids to, you know like a kid you don't want to give a two out of five to a kid on an actual graded canvas system. right <laughs> they're just, right they're just starting out so um and, and what's cool is that all of this used to require so many apps like uh, the Tonal Energy app, uh, Fourscore. I would have to like fiddle around in my Fourscore library to find the right song title for the right instrument. All of this stuff is now basically just happening in the background. All I have open is Obsidian and a web browser. Mm -hmm. And the kid interacts with everything all on the web and it's everything is sort of networked. They can click around. So I don't know. Uh, that's, that's the that's, goal. I'm that's substantial. Like that is really cool. And I, the, the selfish part of me hopes that you're able to like publish a how-to of that because I think that's something that a lot of people would maybe not carry out in the same platforms or the same technology but the idea of it and how to link things together is something that a lot of people would benefit from hearing about and seeing how you did it uh, maybe you already have I don't know but the the I think it's gonna have to be a, a video and I am working through like the student data part of it first I also want to have more of it built out mm -hmm. first well and I, I mean to me that kind of again, it gets to the core of what we're doing as teachers, right? We don't want a kid to get penalized because they're developing. But our LMSs, like Canvas, we use Blackboard at U of H, which I, I use Teams now as my LMS because I tell the students, like, I hate Blackboard, I hate Teams less, so we're going to use Teams because um, it's more Slack-like, but not quite. And it's, yeah, it's none of them are perfect. But because of the high stakes around grading and recording grades and that whole process, this kind of takes some of the sting out of it while still letting the students know where they are in a more kind of criterion reference. Like you're looking at a, a, a bevy of things they should be doing and it's a yes, no binary where, okay, I did two of these well, that would be a bad grade if it was a grade, but it at least gives me information about the things I need to focus on, the three no's that I have left and I can pick one of those no's to turn it into a yes, which to me builds better habits 
than a quiz would, where it's just like, oh, I got four out of five. I'm good. I can move on. And the, the gamification of it, of like, you need to unlock this next thing by getting so many stars. It reminds me of, and maybe this might suggest my age more than anything, but when I was a little kid, we had these things called SRAs, which were reading examples, this giant box of these laminated um, reading examples. You had to answer questions on, and the teacher would grade it, and you had to get so many questions right to move on to the next color. It started with green and ended yeah. with red and a bunch of different things. Um, and I love those. Like I was a giant nerd for that stuff. And this sounds like the skeleton of something like that, that could be, I mean, honestly, here in Texas, we do a lot with excerpts when we get to like the Allstate process and kids are playing stuff out of the Arbens book that is way above their heads. So we break it down into bite-sized chunks and we let them progress through it. But something like this, where it automates a lot of the feedback and, and kind of targets their attention to things they need to focus on versus like, oh, it's all terrible. This would be powerful for kids at any level in any context, as long as they're in a progressive, graduated sort of sequence of instruction towards mastery. The, the, I, I'm going to steal this. We're going to talk about this with my kids this semester. And I may be asking you to come in to talk to them because this is brilliant. I love it. I would love to. Yeah, I'm, I'm really am hoping to. I'm like three episodes editing behind and I have like 20 blog posts I've been sitting on for like two months. But I'm going <laughs> to this is I know that this needs to be something that I put out there by the end of the summer. So I'm hoping to have a video um, that sort of shows how I'm doing it, uh, you know, in a, in a cool way. And yeah, it, it'll, it'll it's definitely um, aspirational gonna i mean even if some of the little technical and automation bits don't work the system at its core is still gonna afford me all of my examples are now not scattered pdfs that have no mm -hmm. connection to each other it's all on the web so everything can now be linked to canvas um and then the student notes are gonna you know at least now every student has a note where even if like some of the little automation like shortcuts and numbers bits don't work i have i think a, a really solid foundation for something where because the kids ask me they're like every time they come in you know they're like, what, which ones was I supposed to practice again? Like not all of them have the self-motivation to write it down in their, right. you know, in their agenda book. Um, and so I showed them this at the tail end of last school year as I was building it. And even, I mean, I'm talking about like sixth graders, like, you know, are looking at this and they're, and I'm afraid that they're going to just think I'm, I'm insane. And like, just like a big computer nerd and they, their jaws dropped. <laughs> so I'm showing a class of like sixth grade flutes, how I can like get this information to them. And I'm like, what, is this too crazy? And they're like, no, we wish we had this all year. This is so crazy. We're jealous that next year's sixth graders are gonna get this. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're not gonna have it. Well, and you picked a great class because generally flute players tend to be more on the, the type A, like I want the information sort of end of the personality spectrum in, in our classrooms. But like, yeah, I, I think every kid would respond to that though, because these kids live in a, a sort of information world that is foreign to my generation for sure, in the sense that we didn't grow up with it. Like we grew up with dial-up modems and that was about as fancy as things got. And now everything's always on, the information's always there. And this speaks to what they know and understand in a way that is completely native. Whereas we had to kind of learn it it's just that's the water that they swim in as fish. They don't know any different. And so I think that speaks to the power of what you're talking about. And I'll be honest, like once you get it up and going, you probably, you know, get someone to actually write like a whole uh, like app around that and turn this into something yeah. that integrates a lot of other features for the benefit of kids. Yeah. And well, the cool thing is that um, it, you know, it is all in Obsidian. So it is plain text files. Like the data is portable. And mm -hmm. um, these systems are, are going to be easier to maintain because it's all happening in plain text, not like, you know, in FileMaker, I had some, you know, I had a lot of little screenshots of the musical excerpts sort of embedded. And then it would sort of like, there was a layout tool that would generate automatically a PDF for mm -hmm. each song in the sequence with the criteria in the tuning drone recommendation on the page. But this is all just like me poking around with my cursor and typing in adjustments, you know, right. I don't have to go like print packets. If I like typed a word wrong somewhere, I can just go change it right on my computer. And, and that's kind of exciting. And, you know, what a lot of people equate this to is uh, recorder karate, which is actually a much more recent version of, uh, you know, when I was in middle school, it was a sticker chart. And mm -hmm. this really is just a giant digital sticker chart. And the kids love this. I mean, you know, it's, you can say it's like external motivation or whatever. I think there's like, I, I really, in my teaching years, the past couple of years have embraced, you know, I, I've embraced the external motivation. We, we, I think there's like, your, your your impulses as an early teacher maybe are to oh no everybody has to like ha come with this love of music and the truth is that like 
there's lots of reasons to be motivated by things other like even as a musician i am yes i am a very internally motivated musician but there are still times where something outside of my own interest in being a better musician is the thing that actually gets me to pick up sticks and and shred for a few hours so like we're, i want to play off that and into that and i actually do give them um each five song packet has a, i give them a colorful ribbon mm. so that's associated with their color-coded packets so like they all get to like tie little ribbons around their instrument case handles and you know as they as they progress through this that that's uh, really and, cool so it's like the dojo model almost like oh i'm a i'm a blue ribbon or i'm a purple ribbon right exactly like i'm on the, on the purple packet i've got a purple ribbon and 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 you know i'm i'm building because the the number of spreadsheet logs their highest number of stars they've ever earned per star um per song mm -hmm. i have a sheet inside of that same numbers spreadsheet that is um what it is is it's basically just a leaderboard of who has mm -hmm. the most stars and so that is going to be embedded in another part of canvas um, because you can actually use an iframe, which is an, a little HTML snippet that mm -hmm. will show a piece of content. And you know, all the um, the iWork suite all operates on iCloud.com now. So I'm basically just taking a web view of that one individual sheet from my numbers database where all this is stored, and that's just published to a part of our LMS. And um, we're trying to figure out a way to get it like a TV screen monitor somewhere in the band orchestra area to like have it like sort of cycle through kind of like when you get out of a laser tag match right you can see everybody just <laughs> like you got hit 14 times but this is great data because you know we want it to be transparent and qualitative at all times but we also like can do a lot of things with that data like it makes decisions you know like who's going to be best uh, the best fit for each of our four band ensembles every year like that data mm -hmm. does help drive those conversations um, it's great, like, you know, it's very, very hard data that administrators can understand, even if they do not understand the musical criteria you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, parents can easily understand it, and the parents have access to the notes, so the parent can also be accountable, or at least helping the kid remain accountable. Right, and I think the other thing, too, it, it feeds into what you were talking about earlier with, you know, that note that has, I call the parent for this kid, and here are the things they're doing, and here's their, their test score like it turns a student from in our, our rosters from just a student in the roster into a narrative into this is where the student is this is where the student was and based on this this is where we think they might go it gives us way more granularity of data to have those conversations with the parents have the conversations with the students especially if they're talking about you know getting out of band or getting out of music me like okay but you've done all these things look at all this stuff that you've committed your time to and all the successes that you've had walking away from that might be less attractive once you realize oh i've done a lot of good things just this is a rough patch like it allows us to embrace the kid by you know the name place and, and desires and family and likes and all the things that frame them as a person it makes that so much easier because we have the data right in front of us versus having to pull it out of the back of our head there are some people that can do that beautifully. The guy I student taught with up in Illinois when I was doing my, my undergrad at Vandercook was a, a gentleman named Ross Kellen at Glenbard East. He's since passed, but he could do that. He knew every kid, knew their parents' names, knew their dog's name, like knew all that stuff. This gives that power to even more of us who are not quite so uh, neurologically gifted as, as Mr. Kellen was. So I think that's awesome. Like this, this is, I don't want to say the way forward for music education, but it's definitely a strong suite of tools for people who are interested in having this kind of access to information and the power that comes with it. Yeah. Those are, those are very wise closing words. So I feel like unless you have anything to add, maybe we move on to some segments. Yeah, let's, let's move on. Oh my gosh, I never actually, I said we were going to do follow-up in news and I never did. I just oh. wanted to, there's only one news item. I was supposed to say this right before we even covered the topic of PKM. Um, Steinberg is having a summer sale until the end of July. Hmm. And there's probably not, I don't know when I'm going to get this episode out. It will probably be before the sale is over, but it's, you should just, I'll link it in the notes. Um, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, Dorico, I've covered a lot on this show. Their iPad app came out about a year ago. That, like the lifetime purchase of that app which I know a lot of people still really like to pay once for their software. Um, mm -hmm. You've been like holding off on Dor buying like the paid version of Dorco on your iPad. This is a, a great time. Um, Cubase has the Cubasis app for iPad. If you need a DAW for iOS, I don't personally use one on, on my iPad, but if you're going to use one, it, you probably should be using Cubasis. Right. Um, so I would just recommend anyone head on over to the Steinberg uh, summer sale and um, you know, Go go take advantage of all of their many creative tools. Uh, do we want to do music of the week first? Sure. Yeah. Okay. This is I'll start. 
So sure. yeah. I always am, am, am intrigued like how much my music listening is now inspired by my two and a half year old and um, trying to find like this weird middle ground of stuff that he likes that is not like made explicitly for kids. <laughs> yes, because um, kids music can be soul sucking sometimes. It really can be. And when he finds something in the challenge, it's like, okay, can we find something that he cannot ruin by asking for it over and over again? Right. Um, and I'm finding that this is less problematic in music that establishes sort of a setting or a mood more than it does tell a story. And so we've been we've been listening to there's actually like uh, I've mentioned this before. Um, Poolsuite.fm is like an internet radio site for like I think like the terms like vaporwave or future bass would be the appropriate terms for this kind of kind of like the music you would associate with like um, like an 80s scene of like the beach, you know, just like uh convertibles driving around and like people soaking in the sun i don't know it's, vaporwave music is very much like in line with this sort of current trend of like doing um makers of all media sort of going for the nostalgia play but also like using modern technology behind it I, stranger things comes to mind as like a show mm -hmm. that's like hey you like 80s stuff we're gonna inject it into your veins but we've got you know but this is in 4k and we're using like modern storytelling tropes and cultural right. concepts and ideas that you recognize, you know, that have evolved since the 80s. Uh, or like I recently uh, came into uh, to possession of a Playdate, which is made by the people who make Mac software, the Panic. They're like a game, they make games, mm -hmm. they make uh, Mac apps, and they make a little yellow, um, it's actually in com uh, collaboration with Teenage Engineering. Mm. Gosh, this is a really long explanation of music of the week. I'm sorry, I didn't even no, say No, this is awesome. I love Teenage, <laughs> I, I think Teenage Engineering is like, a something that more musicians, especially music teachers, need to know about as one of the tools that our kids are going to be using more often than we will. Yeah, they may I mean they make lots of very cool heart musical hardware, very, very high end, but very, very well designed. And they collaborated, they basically with Panic, who makes software, made a gaming system that is definitely supposed to sort of like signal the, you know, the original Game Boy. It's a monochromatic screen. It's like a very bright yellow, little tiny. I mean, it's very small. When I when it came in the mail, I was shocked at how small it is. It's a very small little square rectangle. And it's got like this feeling of like this is an old school gaming system, but actually the entire technology stack, I guess that's not really the right word, but like all the technologies that go into it are like modern. So it's got like a really crisp high resolution screen. It takes USB-C, it's internet connected. Um, you, by buying it, you automatically get 24 games, but two of them beam to you every week. So it's sort of like a season where hmm. every week new games ship. And it's this seems novel, but it's been kind of fun. It has a crank on the side of it, which is an input method for many of the games. Hmm. You like spin a little, a little crank on the side. And I think it's just very delightful. It's definitely one of the like things I've, the most novel things I've ever spent my money on. Um, anyway, so why did I get to this? All oh, right, yes, the nostalgia play. So I don't know, that's what poolsuite.fm is. Anyway, we're listening to Pool Suite. Uh, their SoundCloud has many, many like good kind of like DJ mixes of like the stuff in their database. And um, my son says, what's this, what's this, what's this? And it's a song by an artist called, I think the artist is Pools called Poolside. Pool Suite mm -hmm. FM used to be Poolside FM. Maybe that's actually the reason why they had mm -hmm. to change the name, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, it's just like sort of like, I don't know, it's the kind of music you would like, it reminds me of like the intro to the to the show um, Portlandia. Like, it's oh, just, yeah, just got sort of like washy like synthesizers and like kind of like a vibey, but like medium tempo dance feel to it. And anyway, I'm like, all right, so we look up the name of the song, we find the album, and now he just wants to listen to this like this record over and over and over again, specifically one of the songs on it. And um, I can't say that I hate it. Like it's not, you know, if you're gonna listen to something a hundred times per week, I don't know. It makes me feel kind of like in a in a summer mindset. So I don't know. I'm I'll link it in the notes. That's my music of the week. Yeah, I mean that's that's really cool. And I've I've three kids myself. The Arlis is six, and the twins are three. So we're very much in the let's play this to death sort of uh, mindset. Currently, it's the Sing Two soundtrack is is my eldest daughter's favorite and. The young ones just love Paw Patrol. So that is not my recommendation for the week. That is framing the things I try and stay away from. Um, but actually, I have, I have two groups that I've been listening to a lot lately, and they're, they're similar but different. Um, one is a techno marching band called Muete. Uh, they're out of Leipzig, Germany. 
Um, and they literally just take techno tracks and play them with marching band instruments. They have sousaphone, they have like uh, glockenspiels on harnesses. Like it's, it's, and they dress in these very kind of anachronistic old school marching band outfits. They kind of de disassemble and like put patches on and it looks very, not grungy, just very like, okay, referencing this thing, but it does something different. Um, and they're just, they're really fun to listen to. They're really good. Like they're all really good musicians. And so they have a lot of production value too that goes into the videos they put out and the music that they play. Um, they've been really interesting to me for the reason of the same way like second line bands are interesting out of New Orleans because they take this trope of the marching band and do something different and novel and valuable with it. Um, that's totally different from my background in DCI and, and Bands of America. So I really appreciate that aspect of things. The other, from a different part of the world is a group called Akbang Gonchil from uh, South Korea. They actually were formed at the, I think the 50th anniversary of the, the split or something like that. Um, they are, they kind of take this idea in Korean uh, music culture. There's this thing called Pansori where and I'm probably butchering the pronunciations. I apologize for anyone who knows better, please correct me. But the Pansori was originally a, a, actor who was generally a woman and a drummer and there are these long stories almost like epic stories that they tell and they tell segments of them and it's sung in a, a way that is we wouldn't recognize it as like melody like Mahler would do but it's still melodic and it the Octan Guangchil takes it and kind of meshes it they use these um they use traditional Korean instruments but it sounds very western in its orientation and it's very kind of poppy so it's almost like k-pop but not nearly that produced so it's kind of somewhere in the middle and it's just infectious my kids love it they have no idea none of us speak korean but they love that because it's so engaging and so exciting um and it also exposes them to other cultures which is important for me because i grew up again in in the town in pennsylvania where the roads weren't so giving my my kids access to different cultures is an important part of that. So it's kind of serving multiple purposes for me. Those are my two musical selections. And I'll send you links if you want to put them in the show notes. Yeah, that would be awesome. I'll put all of that in the in the notes to the episode for sure. Okay, very cool. Well, um, I'm going to mention, uh, speaking of, you know, beachy music a moment ago, I'll say that uh, one of the, you know, I was at the beach last week. And while we were listening to the same songs over and over again, um, we were also, you know, driving to and from mm -hmm. the beach. And uh, there's a cool little app uh, that I, I use. It's called On the Way, and you it's a it's like a, you know it functions kind of like a mapping application. You tell it what time you're leaving, where are you going, and then it just charts out what the weather is going to be like at every different point in hmm. that. Sure. Um, it's got a subscription that I'm on the like the seven day trial. I don't think I'm gonna pay for it because I don't think I travel enough to justify it. Um, but it was you know we've got, I had a lot of intense storms in this area lately. And I don't know, I just didn't want to deal with it on the road. So it was cool mm -hmm. to, you know, give me peace of mind to be able to sort of see like what temperature, what weather it was going to be, you know, in all four hours of that drive. So on the way. Awesome. Uh, my app of the week is similar. It's not nearly as, as full featured. It's, it's more of just a weather app, but I live in Texas. And, you know, one of the things we, we deal with is just hot versus hurricanes versus freeze. Like it's, it's not quite Australia, but it's it's similar in the sense of like extremes. But yeah. um, the app that I've really been loving lately in that vein is an app called Carrot, which mm -hmm. is the most offensive. You, you can make it the most offensive weather app in the world or just sarcastic. And it, it does a good job of doing the weather and the interface is really nice. and It's really pretty and really clean, but it will kind of belittle you basically, which is it's it's like Ed DeBevix if you've been there in Chicago, but for a weather app. Um, where you can set it to be like really offensive or just mildly offensive. And it'll say something like, oh, it's really hot outside today, meatbag. Like it's it's just, it's a funny little way to wake up um, in the morning and kind of see what the weather's going to be without becoming totally despondent at the fact that when you get out of the shower, you're going to need to take another shower within five minutes because you're going to sweat through your clothes. That's just one of the fun things about living in this humid oven that we call Houston. I hate to be like, because I talk about apps a lot you know, publicly, I, I don't want this to come across as like um, hyperbole, but the carrot weather is actually one of my favorite apps of all time. And it's, it's got, I keep the widget on my home screen. Oh, nice. So see, cause they have like, you know, if you're on an iPhone, you can do like widgets now. And um, mm -hmm. 
they have there's three sizes of widgets the medium sized widget and it takes up a lot it's it means a lot that i put this widget on my home screen because that's it takes up the place of four apps that can mm -hmm. be there four tappable apps but what it does is it's like on the left side got the hourly forecast and then on the right half it's got the daily forecast so you can see both at a glance and if there's rain it shows a very accurate rain graph on the left half in place of the hourly forecast huh. so like at a glance i can just at all times on my home screen see like hey i mean and, and the, the, it's using great data from dark sky mm -hmm. which is like I mean, I'm telling you, like, if you look at the rain graph and it's like at its peak and then it says in five minutes, it's going to take a slight dip. I will like wait with my groceries outside of the grocery store for that five minute dip before I run to my car. And uh, and it's and it's super accurate. But then they've got all these like cool notifications, like it'll notify you like within a, you know, when a lightning strike is within a certain number of miles from mm -hmm. where your station is. And you can turn off the sarcastic. It used to it's like the, the novelty of it, I feel like, was the original appeal, like, oh, it's going to be mean to me. Mm -hmm. But now it's gotten so good at like just being the most beautiful and easy to understand weather app that I just right agree. I just come to love it for itself, and, and I, I have it in professional mode. I don't do the the silly stuff. <laughs> <laughs> See, I do the silly stuff, but that's just because like I'm ADD and I need that sort of like novelty. But yeah, it it is a really powerful weather app behind all of that. And I mean, we are heading into hurricane season here, so knowing the weather is a really important part of being a, a Texan. And as a former band director, knowing where the, the thunder showers are is a really good thing to know because that's going to define your rehearsal after school during marching band. So those two things make me probably a, a really good use case for that app for its powerful thing. And the ADD makes me, you know, like it for its being sarcastic and being mean. Oh, totally understood. Totally understood. That's actually a pretty good segue into my tech topic of the week. Um, I, I, in, I am a reckless individual and I put the iOS 16 public beta on my iPhone. Oh, geez week yeah um and do i regret it no i, I you know i don't think I, I feel like i should tell people maybe don't do it but also i don't want to tell people what to do like i'll just say this it's a little bit in my experience buggier than previous years that i've put a public beta on my phone but it has this new like custom lock screen thing that i was really anxious to kind of try mm -hmm. out because i've talked on the show before about using focus modes you can like have different custom lock screens that can actually have widgets on them and i'm very excited to see what the carrot weather app does with widgets because they make their information glanceable in a, in a really nice way that works for my brain. So I'm excited to have, have a little widget right on my lock screen from them eventually. Um, anyway, so I've already made like a custom home, a custom lock screen for every single one of my focus modes. And so now like I can change focus modes by just changing my lock screen and that's coming out in the fall for, um, or if you want to be reckless today <laughs> you can go install it <laughs> if, if you want if you want your phone to be you know entertaining on more than one level which is what betas do yeah it's a, it, for sure yeah i mean i've got a custom one for podcast recording right now and it just shows me my show art on the lock screen and then it um silences all notifications um except for from my wife and uh, it shows me my next calendar event the weather outside um and of course because i'm an, a shortcuts automation nerd when i start this particular focus mode or many of my focus modes, um, a shortcut will run that will sometimes do stuff. So like my, I'm podcasting lock screen. Uh, when I turned it on, it also opened up zoom and opened up the show notes for a recording today. And I like, started recording my microphone input and some other things. So that's awesome. That's fun. really cool. Uh, my, my tech tip is way less fancy, way less flashy. It's, it's, um, I, I do work for an organization called the Institute for Composer Diversity. I'm the head of analysis for them. And one of the things we've been doing lately is consolidating lists. And so we found a couple of workflows that work really well to help us basically go through state music lists and go, okay, you, you misspelled Jan van der Roost here, but spelled it right here. So which one's correct? Um, and so it's just using a lot of VLOOKUP and array formulas to make that process quicker. Because one of the lists we're looking at is the New York state list. And there's about 8,000 pieces on there. Wow. Um, so anyway, we can cut down on the going through and, and saying, okay, this composer is actually this person because a lot of the lists are last name, first initial. So when you see like Smith comma C is like, was it Claude Smith? Is it somebody else? that's kind of where we're at in technology. And it's, it's VLOOKUP. If you, if you are a, a spreadsheet person and you don't know VLOOKUP, just do a Google search, watch a couple YouTube videos. It will save your life thousands of times over. It's not fancy. It's not like flashy, but it's super powerful. And once you know it, you will never want to go back. 
Right on. Wow. Very good one. Cool. Excellent. I love it. I feel cool. like we covered quite a lot of ground. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I think so. Definitely. But this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for the invite. I, I'm, I'm really happy we were able to do this. Like, I, again, I, this is my happy place. So, so thank you for affording me the opportunity to spend two hours in my happy place. Yeah, I'm so glad you could do it. And I look forward to chatting very soon. Yeah, definitely. All right. Take care. Okay, take care. See you later. Bye. Bye. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for the episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to blog posts through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast in the podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. Please rate and review this show in the podcast app. It absolutely helps. It'll take a second and just a few taps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about it. Learn more about my music and teaching career at RobbieBurns.com. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube at Robbie Burns. Please consider supporting me on Patreon at Patreon.com slash Music Ed Tech Talk. All support tiers get perks, but even the base tier gets you a monthly video update with an app and music recommendation and some tech tips. Of course, also access to the Music Ed Tech Talk Discord community where you can chat with other supporters and guests of the show about music, apps, pedagogy, lesson ideas, tech support, and more. It's a fun place to be, and I hope to connect with you soon. Thanks to this week's sponsor, Scale Exercise Play Along Tracks. Be sure to check it out, and we'll see you next time.